my pleasure now to invite Professor Len Harrison to the stage. So Len is an SPIF from the NHMRC, and he's um, really imprinted on the Ward Analyzer Hall Institute many years of research. He's led the division of autoimmunity over many years and also has been clinically active, as Peter mentioned before, as an endocrinologist with a particular interest in, in understanding how type 1 diabetes is regulated and how clinical improvements can be made. Um, he's received numerous awards and one of his uh, prominent discoveries pertains to identifying proinsulin as an important autoantigen in the context. So please welcome Len. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sammy, and thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, this, thank you. This afternoon, I actually uh, began to appreciate that many of you in the audience were probably not immunologists. Um, so I um, have decided just to take some quotes from something I wrote um, several years ago, uh, just as an introduction to my talk. And um, they're, they're really comments about um, the the immunological concept of, of self versus non-self, which has been a persistent um, metaphor in immunology for many, many years, which I think uh, has probably um, served its purpose. <clears throat> um, this is relevant to autoimmune disease, um, and I'll read this just to save time, uh, where we want to avoid uh, immunity to self. Uh, and on the other side of the coin, it's relevant to cancer, uh, where we might want to promote immunity to self, or at least altered, altered self. So we begin over a century ago when Paul Ehrlich foresaw the consequences of loss of immune tolerance to self, which he called, uh, which he termed horror autotoxicus. Um, and this was before autoimmune diseases were ever described. Um, by the 1950s, the term self-non-self had been introduced as a con convenient metaphor for understanding immune reactivity. In 1957, Ernst Wittebsky defined autoimmune diseases according to Cox postulates that had been used for infectious uh, diseases. He defined autoimmune diseases as being due to pathogenic immune responses to self-antigens, auto, what we call autoantigens. And parenthetically, I should say, actually, that um, even today, it's extremely difficult in humans to identify uh, not just autoantigens, but autoantigens which are pathogenic. We have many antibodies and sometimes T cells to autoantigens that we can measure, but defining which of those autoantigens are actually driving the autoimmune disease is very, very difficult. Now, uh, the concept of central tolerance proposed by Joshua Lederberg in 1959, referred to the silencing of developing lymphocytes, T cells in the thymus or B cells in the bone marrow, by uh, their unresponsiveness or their death, induced by their recognition of self-antigens, either in the thymus or in the bone marrow. Although this was supported by later experimental evidence, central tolerance isn't absolute, and in fact it cannot be absolute. Developing T cells with high avidity for self-antigens or self-antigen peptides present in the thymus and recognised in the context of their binding to what are called major histocompatibility complex molecules, the subject of the Nobel Prize to Peter and uh, Rolf Zinkenogel, um, that recognition uh, resulting in deletion by apoptosis uh, of T cells from the T cell repertoire has been called negative selection. However, lower avidity T cell interactions with self antigens in the thymus and B cells in the bone marrow uh, do not lead to negative selection or deletion. And um, those T cells, together with other T cells that are called regulatory T cells that are selected in the thymus uh, on, by a process called positive selection, um, get out of the thymus and end up in the periphery. So in the periphery we have uh, both T cells with the potential to be pathogenic uh, and T cells that regulate them called natural regulatory T cells. In fact, self antigens uh, are not only expressed in the thymus during development but also in lymphoid tissues in the periphery, um, extending this 
mechanism in the thymus geographically, but also in time postnatally. <clears throat> now, avoiding horror autotoxicus is more complex than central tolerance, and the self-non-self -self metaphor may have outlived its purpose. An effective immune system requires both cognitive specificity and cognitive diversity. And this cognition is built on molecular structures that have existed in many cases for many millions of years, from microbes up to mammals. So there is a huge overlap between self and non-self, and it's not possible to conceive of dichotomous, non-overlapping universes of self and non-self. Um, and it's, this apparent paradox uh, is resolved by combining overlapping self and non-self recognition with regulatory mechanis mechanisms in the periphery of our body outside the thymus and the bone marrow that operate in appropriate contexts. So immunity to self, which we call autoimmunity, is physiological and it's usually protective. Activation of potentially pathogenic self-reactive uh, T cells or B cells is normally kept in check. And this is illustrated by natural or deliberate mutations in various regulatory pathways. For example, there's a gene that we call the FOXP3 gene, which is a master transcription factor for natural regulatory T cells. And in activation of this gene, um, naturally, um, because of genetic mutations or deliberately in the laboratory, uh, leads to a lack of these natural regulatory cells and the, uh, the, uh, the development of widespread autoimmunity in early life, something that's known as the IPEX syndrome. Now, the regulation by thymic-derived natural regulatory T cells, which I just said are dependent on this transcription factor, FOXP3, is complemented by induced regulatory T cells generated in what we call tolerogenic environments in the body, especially in the gut, and there is evidence that enhanced uh, immunity in the mucosal Im immune system, in the gut in particular, uh, promotes the development of autoimmune disease. So having got that off my, my shoulders, I now want to um, continue and just tell you that there are, uh, at current count, um, uh, 81 autoimmune diseases. Uh, with a prevalence uh, in females uh, overall in the population of 7% and in males 3%, with a maximum incidence between 20 and 50 years of age in the productive periods of our lives, in our early adult lives. And an important thing to appreciate is that autoimmune diseases, along with other immune diseases, in particular allergies, have been increasing gradually since uh, the middle of last century, since just after the Second World War. Now, here are some of those 81 uh, autoimmune diseases listed here. Uh, systemic here, uh, organ or tissue specific here and here, and some that are, are directed, particularly antibodies, autoantibodies being directed to um, specific uh, receptor switches uh, on cells in the thyroid gland, in the muscles, in the skin, and in the parathyroid gland. So this is a way of classifying autoimmune diseases, some of them at least. Now, today I want to focus on the one that we spend most time on, and that is type 1 diabetes. And some of the things I'm going to say about type 1 diabetes um, will apply um, to the other autoimmune diseases. And the the, the, one of the key things I want to, uh, one of the messages, the key messages of today for me is to um, convince you that autoimmune diseases are not only genetically based but driven by the environment. And that's an area where we can all um, pay attention to in terms of prevention. So type 1 diabetes is, uh, as many of you know, one of the commonest chronic diseases from childhood about 140,000 individuals in Australia. Um, the, as I mentioned, for this and other autoimmune diseases, the incidence has increased in the case of type 1 diabetes, doubling in the last 20 years. Costs a lot to treat patients, about $8,000 a year, a uh, total of 500 million, not including the complications, the longer term complications. Major single cause of kidney and vision failure in adults, 
and a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease, which doesn't often appear on death certificates. Now, you don't die from diabetes, either type 1 or type 2. You die from the complications. OK. Now, uh, this uh, disorder is due to uh, an attack by uh, the immune system on the cells in the pancreas in these structures called islets in the pancreas. Uh, the cells in these islets that make insulin are called beta cells are the immune cells, which are shown here as you know, very dark, small cells. These are the lymphocytes, the T cells and the B cells invading the islet and um, destroying the, the beta cells that make insulin, which are 90%, 80 to 90% of the cells in the islet. And uh, this disease is recognised as a disease when a lack of insulin leads to an uh, increase in the blood glucose level, hyperglycemia, and associated symptoms and complications, acute complications of newly diagnosed diabetes. Um, this is an immune disease that is recognised clinically as a metabolic disease, and therein lies a problem for us in prevention. Now, type 1 diabetes, like other autoimmune diseases, uh, is predisposed to by multiple genes. It's a, what's called a polygenic disorder, as are all other autoimmune diseases in the main. And in type 1 diabetes, um, the major genes that predispose are called HLA genes. These are the major histocompatibility complex genes that uh, Peter has mentioned and I've mentioned previously in humans, HLA genes. And you, they account for about a large proportion of the genetic risk, and in fact about 50% of the lifetime risk is due to HLA genes. The second most important genetic locus predisposing to type 1 diabetes is the insulin gene itself. And this may explain totally or in part why the immune response is directed to the beta cells, because uh, as Sammy mentioned, uh, we and others sh have shown that that insulin in the beta cell is the antigen, uh, or is the major antigen that appears to be driving beta cell destruction. So here we have a genetic basis uh, for that. And then a lot of other genes here. Now, uh, studies that uh, our colleagues, we and our colleagues have done um, in a program supported by the National Health and Medical Research Council show that um, there are subtypes of type 1 diabetes based on the collections of different sets of these genes, or different genes into a number of different sets. And they, that's a very interesting area. So even a disease like type 1 diabetes is not homogeneous, it's genetically and clinically heterogeneous. And one of the very interesting things that we've realised in the last few years is that we used to think this was only a disease of childhood, but in fact, half the people with type 1 diabetes present with a slower progressive destruction of beta cells after the age of 18. So about 10% of people presenting with diabetes in adult life have slowly progressive type 1 diabetes with a different set of these uh, genes. <coughs> now, environment uh, is responsible for the increased incidence of this disease and uh, other autoimmune and allergic diseases. And this is a study by um, Spiros Volanos, who was a PhD student uh, with me a number of years ago. And what it shows is that the contribution of those um, high-risk HLA genes that I mentioned account for most of the risk, the contribution of the HLA-DR genes, which um, here DR34 is the highest risk gene, genes, they're called the phenotype here, in, <clears throat> before the 1980s accounted for 70% of children presenting with type 1 diabetes. And if you look over the decades, the contribution of the HLA genes, the high-risk HLA genes to type, to type 1 diabetes has decreased. And the lower-risk genes, DR4X, DR3X and others, which I haven't put on here, has been increasing. And what this means is that the rising incidence of type 1 diabetes is associated with increasing penetrance of lower risk genes. So all of the increase in the last 30 years of type 1 diabetes in Australia and in other parts of the world where people of European extraction have emigrated to North America and Europe, all of the increase has been due 
to the environment, um, pulling in kids with lower risk genes. So this is a really striking demonstration, I think, uh, of the interaction, the, the environment gene interaction. Okay, um, now if you ever wanted evidence for uh, the role of environment in type 1 diabetes and in other autoimmune and allergic diseases, you look at Finland here compared to neighbouring Karelia in Russia. Now this is the incidence of type 1 diabetes in Finland, 55 per 100,000 per year, and in neighbouring Karelia, 7.4. This border was established in the early 50s. Uh, the people living on either side of the border are very similar ethnically, but they're very different in terms of their environments. Um, you know, as you can imagine, you know, Finland is a very modern, well-developed uh, um, society, whereas Karelia uh, is only still coming out of a rather uh, somewhat, I don't want to be disparaging, medieval sort of existence, a very, very many differences in the way people live in those two societies. And uh, more recently of interest to us, the, the gut microbiome in Finland uh, is very much restricted in its diversity compared to that in Karelia. So we're very interested in autoimmunity and what's going on with the, um, all those hundreds, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, gut uh, microbes. Um, and that are at the interface between us and the environment out there in the world. And uh, the, one of the, the striking things about Finland versus Karelia is the difference not only in the diversity of the microbiome being less here, but also the appearance of some uh, bacteria um, that are distinct and characterise type 1 diabetes uh, in Finland versus Karelia, which I don't have time to go into. Now, in the lab, we can show the importance of the, of the environment and, indeed, the microbiome. So these are non-obese diabetic mice that get type 1 diabetes spontaneously. The females are about 80% by 240 days of age and a lesser incidence in the male. And the incidence of disease in these mice depends on conditions of housing and diet. So here we go. Um, we can show here that by altering the microbiota of these mice, you can regulate the development of type 1 diabetes. So here are mice here um, that are kept in Weehai, in the animal facilities at Weehai. Um, in this particular experiment, um, the incidence was 55%, um, a bit lower than I just mentioned, but depends on the age of the mice. But in the same experiment, where the mice were made germ-free with no microbiome, the incidence was 100%, and this occurred within six months. And if you take the mice out of the institute and you take them home and take them to your little farm out in the Yarra Valley and leave them there for a few months, the incidence drops to 14%. So a huge effect of the environment um, on the incidence of disease. Many things have changed in the environment, um, and. Uh, that the ones that are really relevant here, that we know about, are listed here. Now, just before I um, quick, quickly deal with this slide, I want to mention that um, GM means gut microbiome, and the asterisk means that um, this particular environmental uh, agent or factor has been shown to be relevant, at least in epidemiological studies, in type 1 diabetes. Uh, so this means that um, this factor, more calories, alters the gut microbiome, and the asterisk means that more calories have been shown by us and others in the world to uh, promote the development of type 1 diabetes, not just type 2 diabetes. So uh, more calories, this is what's changed. More calories, foods of poorer quality, less diverse food, uh, many additives in food, most of which alter the gut microbiome, less physical activity, uh, less sunlight, uh, less vitamin D associated with type 1 diabetes and other autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis. More hygiene affects the gut microbiome uh, and the incidence of type 1 diabetes. Uh, less infections in early life, uh, more C-sections. So the uh, the frequency of caesarean sections in 
Um, Melbourne is 30% uh, now and rising, higher in other countries. C-sections have been associated with an increased prevalence uh, and incidence, I mean, of uh, type 1 diabetes as well as uh, allergic diseases, asthma and food allergy. Uh, and again, that's probably because the gut microbiome after a C-section uh, in a baby is very different than after normal vaginal delivery. We could talk about these things for the next two or three hours, but just wanted to give you a, uh, a rough perspective on how the environment has changed in our society. And this actually gives us clues as to how we might investigate the increased incidence of autoimmune diseases under these conditions. We clearly need longitudinal studies following um, children from early life in which we combine all of the ohms, the microbiome, the metabolome, the epigenome with the environment and trying to understand how that's driving changes in immune function that lead to autoimmune disease. Now, finally, I just want to say something about the treatment of um, autoimmune disease. Uh, traditionally, uh, as clinicians, we have used non-specific agents, immune-suppressing agents, such as steroids, azathioprine, methotrexate, etc., uh, in the clinic. But in the last uh, decade or so, uh, newer, what are called um, targeted biologic agents, have been introduced and are much more effective in uh, sparing disease. Um, unfortunately, not type 1 diabetes. So rheumatoid arthritis here are some of the biologic agents which target specific immune molecules. Uh, these are funny names here, but they're all mainly uh, engineered what are called monoclonal antibodies, and they target and block uh, these immune factors, tumor necrosis factor, um, CD20, uh, which is a, a marker on B lymphocytes, uh, and another cytokine, interleukin-6 here, and so on. Now, these um, protect against tissue destruction uh, and uh, made a major difference to the outcome for people with rheumatoid arthritis. To a lesser extent, lupus, um, to a lesser extent, but um, things are moving, uh, and um, also other diseases, other autoimmune diseases like psoriasis, for example. And we have um, an increasing plethora of these agents, and it will be really challenging to work out how to use them. It is challenging to work out how to use them uh, most efficaciously. When we come to type 1 diabetes, though, unfortunately the situation is not as uh, rosy. Uh, these are some of the examples of agents that have been used in type 1 diabetes uh, with really no long-lasting success. And the reason for this uh, is as follows, and that is, we, we, ethically, we can only treat um, people with type 1 diabetes type 1 diabetes here when they present clinically, whereas in fact we should be treating them here when they first develop the autoimmune pathology. And that's what we do in rheumatoid arthritis. Someone presents with rheumatoid arthritis with a swollen joint and you see the disease, the clinical disease, and you know that under that joint there's inflammation. And you, you then go in with one of these biologic agents and you improve the outcome for that person dramatically. But we can't do that in type 1 diabetes until the clinical world recognises that this isn't a metabolic disease, it's, a, it's, a, it's an immunological disease that starts here. Now, studies that we and others have done around the world and have been published in the last year or two show that um, about 80 to 90 per cent of children who present with type 1 diabetes by the age of 18 actually have um, islet. Um, anti-beta cell autoantibodies detectable in the first three years of life. So this changes the whole paradigm considerably because if you detect a child with uh, antibodies to the beta cells at this stage uh, in the first few years of life, let's say birth is around here, then you can uh, really uh, have a very high uh, predictive value on that child developing type 1 diabetes. So we have a huge window there uh, for where we can potentially prevent disease if only we could um, have the agents. So having the, no options, um, we uh, have had to turn to uh, what's known as antigen-specific or autoantigen-specific vaccination. The premise here is that immune tolerance to self-antigens uh, 
is physiological, as I mentioned at the beginning, and uh, prevents autoimmune disease in healthy people. And in rodent models, um, we showed in the 1990s and others as well showed that you could prevent autoimmune disease by boosting immune tolerance to self-antigens. And one of the translatable ways of doing that in humans is by administering the antigen to the mucosal immune system. And that's either orally, nasally, or by other potential ways. Uh, and that induces these regulatory T cells, which can be shown in animals to prevent autoimmune disease. So this is the approach we took because it was safe, it was ethically acceptable, and it didn't require um, all the sort of regulatory pathways that you normally have to go through. Which antigen? Well, as Sammy mentioned in the introduction, for us it was insulin or pro-insulin based on uh, things we had um, learnt over the years. Um, and I just want to point out that in those children developing uh, type 1 diabetes in the early years of their life, in most cases the primary autoimmune target of the autoantibodies is insulin itself. Okay. But in the NOD mice that I showed you, we actually totally prevented type 1 diabetes by transgenically expressing um, insulin uh, in excess in the thymus gland and in antigen-presenting cells. So there's really no doubt that insulin is an important driver of the process. And when we gave nasal insulin, uh, again, a study by Spiros Filanos, who's an endocrinologist at the Royal Melbourne Hospital now, when we gave nasal insulin uh, in a, a randomised placebo-controlled trial to individuals, and then subsequently vaccinated them normally within the, sorry, I shouldn't use the word vaccination in two senses, but we vaccinated them intranasally with insulin. Uh, There's a different sort of vaccination than Peter mentioned. This is a negative vaccine to try and um, change the immune system so that it protects against an autoimmune disease. Uh, and then we came back and injected insulin subcutaneously. You can see the difference uh, in the immune response to the subcutaneous insulin. So this is after nasal insulin and this is after placebo. So nasal insulin suppressed very significantly the antibody response to injected insulin. <clears throat> and this results, this, this led to, or as you know, is a rationale for the current study that we're doing, the current trial, which will be um, uncoded in the next couple of months where we screened 11,000 relatives for autoantibodies to beta cell proteins. We um, selected those who were positive. We staged them to have a 40% risk of diabetes within five years. We randomised 110 participants to treatment of placebo. And um, this is known as the intranasal insulin trial too. Uh, we are hopeful, but um, we're not sure whether the uh, changes that we saw in the immune function after nasal insulin, the tolerance to insulin that we demonstrated will extend to tolerance to our own insulin uh, and prevent, uh, prevent type 1 diabetes. But we'll need to see. And finally, just a last slide. In my um, uh, approach now to uh, autoimmune disease, at least type 1 diabetes, is to try to link up the environment which what we call the exposome, uh, with gene expression um, by the epigenome. These are all the chemical changes that occur on DNA induced by the environment that alter gene expression and therefore may alter immune function uh, and lead to immune diseases. Thank you.